Hey, everybody, I'm Mo Anderson, and this is Perpetual Motion. Come on in, join me in the studio. I've got a special guest I want you to meet. She's Juanita Wheeler. She's an expert on public speaking who has coached more than 100, yes, I said 100 TEDx speakers. And she's here to help you and me level up our communication and finally, finally have our voices heard. Hey, welcome, Juanita. Thank you so much, Dr. Mo. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. All the way from, is it Brisbane, Australia? Is that where we are? Yes. Uh, here we pronounce it Brisbane. So you Brisbane. just got to imagine it's B-R-I-Z-B-N with no vowels at the end. Got it. I have not had the opportunity to visit Australia yet. I've, I've interviewed quite a few guests from there. So I've, I don't think I've heard anyone native even pronounce the word Brisbane. Is that close? <laughs> Oh, you just nailed it. It's like you're a local. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, let's start with the burning question. Everyone wants to know, how do you land a TED or TEDx talk? Yes, you're right. It is the burning question. I get asked that more often than any other question anytime I go to an event. Uh, so TED is the uh, has been running since 1984. And it is the global, the main um, part of TED. It, uh, they, they find their speakers for a variety of ways, uh, including an idea search that they do at different times. They actually just ran an idea search for looking for ideas in, UK, in the UK that people could apply for. Um, mm -hmm. And so there are lots of different ways. TEDx events are the boots on the ground, the community-based versions of TED events. So TEDx events run, as you would know, with a license uh, from mm -hmm. TED. And so each individual event in the community can decide how they go about finding the speakers for their events. It's about 50-50. So about 50% of events do open calls. And mm -hmm. so they will put a call out and you can apply to be a speaker at their event. The other 50% are uh, uh, tap on the shoulder. Um, so you can't apply, but they're always out there looking for great ideas and potential speakers. And some events do a little bit of a hybrid in between. So mm -hmm. I run TEDx Brisbane here in Australia. So we're a tap on the shoulder event. But at the same time, we run a one-minute pitch competition every year. So if you are going to attend our event, you can apply and submit a one-minute video of your idea. We pick the best six to eight and they get to step into the red circle on the day mm -hmm. and give their TED talk, their TEDx talk. And then a number of our speakers each year are typically drawn from the pool of previous year finalists. So there's a lot of different ways you can do it. I actually have a LinkedIn post about this that's aptly titled, So You Want to Give a TEDx Talk uh, with Suggestions. But if you want to, in essence, the things I would do is hone your idea into mm -hmm. ideally 12 words or less, start talking about it and getting it out, word out about it. So you can get into publications, you can talk to your universities and see if they have an alumni newsletter, try local mm -hmm. media, talk to business leaders, let everybody know what your idea is and what you're doing about it. And your local TEDx will hopefully find you. Awesome. Awesome. Do you hear that squeaking or? I am so sorry. I just had a whole chunk of cockatoos land on my back deck. Oh, um, okay. Welcome like... to Australia. Um, I think <laughs> we can start over if you like. It was really no, we are, me. we are not starting over because uh, one of the things and, and we're going to be talking about public speaking and communication is that the show must just go on. But I was wondering if it was the uh, audio equipment or because it was such an unusual sound. So that's what a cockatoo sounds like outside of a zoo. So <laughs> yeah, um, I have a flock at the moment of 12 native wild cockatoos who've just decided it's the perfect time to land on my back deck. Of um, course they did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But as you say, the show goes on. You just have to be prepared to keep going. Um, Absolutely. Uh, and that's that's a big part. We both are, you know, 
do a lot of communications and public speaking, and that's a big part of it, maintaining your composure and even making a joke out of it, which is what I tend to do. If there's some odd type interruption, just make light of it and not just let yourself get all stressed out. And I'm, I'm glad you, yes. I'm glad you explained the different ways that people get uh, invited. I I was actually in that bucket of doing a pitch when I, I did TEDx uh, Oshkosh. And for the regional ones, they told me that they really don't accept a lot of people outside of their area. In fact, I was the only one when I did my TEDx talk. Everyone else was from that area. But it's possible. So even though ideally you'd be in your region for transportation and everything else, it's uh, also there There may be opportunities for you to speak in other places. Uh, one of That's my absolutely- friends. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. That's absolutely true. And it's really important. Um, our TEDx, for example, and we're quite common uh, in mm-hmm. that regard, we try to aim for about 80% of our speakers to be local to showcase our city and about mm-hmm. 20% of them we bring in for other pla- from other places, um, now sometimes internationally, because we think our city needs to hear that idea and it's something that's really poignant. So sometimes it's, it's great to be in your city and mm-hmm. certainly TEDx organisers are looking for events and speakers from locally. But also sometimes there will be a TEDx who has a particular theme or they're perhaps running a small salon on a very specific topic. Um, Maybe it's about space. Maybe it's about justice. uh, And it's in a totally different city. But if that's your area of expertise, absolutely, and they open and they open applications or you know that that's going to be their theme, Mm -hmm. absolutely you should approach them and let them know. I see that you're having an event and the theme is justice um, or space. I happen Mm -hmm. to be an astronaut. I'd be interested in speaking. Bam, bam. It makes a lot of sense. It it could open a door. And it it is nice uh, to have that mix of people uh, who are local and from outside as well. What are, I mean, you've got so much experience with this. What What's the biggest mix, misconception or one of the biggest misconceptions about speaking on the TED or TEDx stage? I think the largest misconception is that it is a stage made for professional speakers uh, and, and for life coaches and motivational speakers. And one of the things that TEDx says in its curation guidelines really clearly is this is not a platform for that. This is a mm-hmm. platform for the sharing of amazing ideas. So we're looking for people who have a great idea that is new and novel. So we don't want to put an idea on our stage if there's already been six TEDx talks about it. Right. So what is something about you and your idea or your experience that means that you can bring a perspective or an idea that is completely new and it's the idea we're chasing not the really slick, you know, 20 years experience speaker necessarily. We Mm. want somebody who can speak that isn't going to be completely paralyzed with fear. But I always say to our speakers, it's your job to have a brilliant idea that shows you're a thought leader in your space. It's our job to help you get it to the point where you can articulate it succinctly, persuasively, compellingly, and then stand on the stage and do it with finesse. That is with our finesse. job. Your job is to bring the idea. Yes. It, yes. And, and I love that. I was surprised at how much they worked with us uh, when I did my talk. I thought it was just kind of going to be, okay, you accept it. This is when the show is, you know, go do your thing and, and be ready because you don't, you don't know. You just see these people on stage. You're not sure where they came from, how they got there. But yes, there is a lot of rehearsal and deadlines and it's really a big commitment. It's not just something to do off the cuff. And and I love that there are people like you who are coaching the speakers because it's a reflection on TEDx Brisbane as well. If they, you know, these, these are seen all over the world, right? Absolutely. Our TEDx Brisbane TEDx talks alone, just our talks, have uh, amassed over 33 million views globally. Oh, wow. So, you know, we came to play. Um, yeah. and <laughs> That's impressive. So, so we are very, very serious about who we stick on our stage, how we work with them. We, we will work with our speakers for five months in the lead up to mm-hmm. our event. It's at least 100 hours of 
work on their part, you know, multiple revisions, everything is fact checked, everything is meticulously crafted. We go through speech writers, editors, performance coaching, the entire thing. And as you say, lots of deadlines, lots of milestones. But the goal is with us is to make sure that not only do they deliver the best talk on the day that they can as the best version of themselves so it's still authentically them but them on their best speaking day but we want to give them these skills because we believe in what they do we want them to take these skills and use them again and again and again for the rest of their career and help mm -hmm. amplify the work that they're doing and and that's that's our contribution that's our mission Wow, that's a beautiful mission. I got to give you some applause for that. That is fantastic. Um, there's not just to have that kind of commitment. And most of the people are volunteers. That is amazing. I love it. I love it. 33 million views. Wow. What separates a, a TEDx talk from motivational speaking or pitching a product? You touched on it a, a little bit, but I think a lot of people still think it's a motivational speech and it's not. No, and, and that is the misconception. It's a really important, and I when I explain it to people and try and do it succinctly, um, I'll say a TEDx talk can and should be motivating, but it's mm -hmm. not a motivational talk. Uh, mm. So a lot of motivational talks and motivational speakers they can elevate people, they can make them feel good and it can inspire them to do things, but it typically is not based around a single idea that's rigorously evidence-based and fact-checked. It can just be, here was my experience in life, this is what I did, I have overcome this, you can too, and everyone feels great. And there is absolutely a place for that. As, mm -hmm. you know, the number of people who go to those events show, you know, there is a real calling for that and it is a right. unique skill in, in and of itself. TEDx talks are quite different. It is all about the idea. So you are explaining to people, here is a problem. Mm -hmm. Here is why you should care about that problem. Here is this unique idea that I have or a new perspective that I have. This idea is worth sharing and it's going to make a difference. And then if you listen to me and accept this, this is the happily ever after. Now, that journey of explaining the idea could involve people telling their personal narrative. Uh, it could involve that because you have to explain how you came to develop this idea or what motivated you. So the talk can be motivating, but mm -hmm. it is focused around an evidence-based idea distinct from personal experience alone. Makes sense. Makes sense. Well, moving from TEDx talks and TED talks to just the broader area of public speaking for someone who just wants to communicate better, but they are, as a large percentage of the population, terrified of public speaking, whether it's a, a small group at their company, the family picnic, or a big stage. What tips uh, would you offer to help them get more comfortable on the stage and, and communicate better? Well, glossophobia, which is the technical term for a fear of public speaking, and that can range oh, from I didn't slight know that. Yeah, and it can range from slight nerves all the way to absolute paralysis. I can't get on the stage. Experts suggest it can be as high as 75% of the population. So mm -hmm. it is a very significant issue. And so if you're feeling like, oh, my gosh, I'm terrified of public speaking, good news, you're in the vast majority of humans. Um, so that's a, an important thing to start. It's not a small subset. You are in a very good company. Uh, but the thing I like to tell people when I start is if you are leaving your house and speaking mm -hmm. in public, then you are already public, public speaking. Public speaking, yes. You are already public speaking. So how about we work to put aside the nerves, put aside the fear, learn how to do it well because you're mm -hmm. already doing it, and then once you know how to do it well, strategically, persuasively, then you're going to be able to champion your ideas. And as you say, that's not just on a TEDx stage or in an auditorium speaking to 2,000 people. That can be a one-on-one -on -one discussion with your boss. Mm -hmm. That could be in a boardroom pitching to three people a potential partnership or a collaboration or a product sale. There mm -hmm. are lots of times you need 
public speaking. It's basically continuous. So my tips would be, first of all, if you think I could never do public speaking, uh, you already are. Hello. So your, <laughs> your aim is just to do it better. Um, there are multiple different ways that people experience fear of public speaking. Uh, no two humans are exactly the same. So there is no one, anyone who tells you that there is a one step fix for everybody who's scared of public speaking has no appreciation of the uniqueness and the complexity of human beings. They are all different. So having coached now over 100 TEDx speakers, I see there are way, many different ways people um, deal with those nerves. So, um, you know, the first part of nerves is before you even apply. There are people who are so fearful they'll embarrass themselves, they don't even apply for speaking gigs or put their hand up or raise their hand in meetings to champion their own idea. And mm -hmm. that was me 20 years ago. Uh, so no. I'm very familiar with that. Screaming introvert. And I, my preferred communication method was in writing. So I would write everything down and submit proposals and emails and newsflash, too long didn't read. People aren't really necessarily fans of reading complicated plans. And I would then find myself in a meeting and somebody else would stand up and pitch an alternative idea verbally and in a compelling manner. And that idea, even if it wasn't as good, would get up. Uh, and so that was vexing to me. And I worked out, okay, I have to get over this. I just have to suck it up. If I care about my ideas, then I'm going to have to be prepared to champion them. And that means I'm going to have to learn how to do this. Put the introvert aside, put the fear factor aside and just learn how to do it well. So the first part of fear, don't let that stop you. Don't let that stop you from speaking. And you're speaking anyway, but don't let that stop you from doing it well and championing your ideas because no one can champion your ideas as well as you can. And also don't let your fear decide how successful you are going to be or how many of your ideas will come to fruition. I don't want to leave that up to fear. I'm going to decide how good right. my career progression is going to be. So exactly. don't let that point of fear stop you. Just go. Um, own your awesome. Deal with it. Um, and then there's fear. Own your awesome. I love that. <laughs> Then there's the fear after you've been accepted for a speaking gig up until the day, which is, oh my gosh, how many things could go wrong? What if no one shows up? What if no one claps? What if I get booed? What if I make a mistake? What if I forget my lines? There are all these things and I'm like, okay, cool. But first of all, let's just start with take a deep breath. What if everything went right? What if exactly. you nailed this? What if you exactly. consolidated your position as the thought leader on this space, whether that's in your company or in your industry or broader? So what if everything, just start with that. What if everything went right? What could possibly happen? And all those other things you have, list down. I work with my clients. I might list every single fear you have about what's going to go wrong. It's like, I'm going to forget my lines. I'm like, awesome. Let's write the strategy. We're not going to leave that to chance. What steps are we actively going to take to make sure that doesn't happen? Uh, or, you know, what if I, what if I, what if I? Great. Excellent. We write a strategy for literally every fear and we get to the end of these lists and I'm like, cool, what else you got? Yeah, uh, yeah. And they get to the point where like, no, no, I'm in charge. I know exactly what I have to do. I'm like, great. You and faced then, your fears. Right. Yes. And not only are you facing them, you're taking ownership and you're saying, I'm right, in charge right. of this. I'm taking action to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, because, you know, oh my gosh, don't just leave that out there hanging and worry about it. Like, no, no, we can solve every one of these things. And then it's funny, just before people go on stage, um, People deal with fear all very different ways, all that nervous energy. I always say to people, you want a little bit of healthy nerves. Healthy mm -hmm. nerves are good. Healthy nerves give you that little bump of adrenaline. Healthy nerves says, this is important and I want to do it well. What you don't want is crippling anxiety because that's not helping anybody. As, as my husband Rob would say, does that help? Is, you know, it's feeling like that helping. I'm like, no. It's like, yeah, cool. Like, hell, stop, well, stop, it. stop that then. Yeah, stop it then. It's like, does it help? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, yeah. That's not necessarily what I wanted to hear in that moment, honey, but, you know, yes, well played. Um, but it's really interesting. So I've seen, you know, over 100 TEDx speakers now, and you will see 
one person who we go through a process of going what calms you or if you're nervous what boosts you up what do you need beforehand and so mm -hmm. I've now seen the full gamut I've seen people who are running up and down stairs backstage to shake off burn off nervous energy that was making them fidgety because they know that's what works for them I've seen you know tiny little academic skinny middle-aged white woman um you know, listening to her earbuds blaring. And as I walk past, I realize she's playing Rage Against the Machine, killing in the name of. And I'm like, okay, that was a bit wow. of a disconnect, but that worked for you. And then there'll be somebody else in a hallway in a dark corner listening to the audio of their recording of their own mm -hmm. talk, which I get all my speakers to do. Audio record your own talk and listen to it over and over again. Right. Um, it's great for memorizing um, and also to know, just like listening to a rock song, but they have to be in the dark. And then you'll go into another room and someone will say, talk to me about anything except this speech. Like mm -hmm. right up until the moment they go to say, talk to me about your dating life. Talk to me about the weather. Talk to me about anything but. So the, the important thing is once you work out and put, go through the, the effort of finding out what will work for you, whether that's before you walk into your boardroom at your office or before you give a group training session to your team or a TEDx talk, once you work out what works for you as a human, you've got that for life and you can use it over and over and over again. Absolutely. That's a great tip. I actually listened to, uh, I just did this. I was at uh, LSU uh, Alexandria speaking a couple of days ago and I listened to great speakers. I'll listen to uh, ministers. I'll listen to another TEDx talk. I listen to great speakers in that inspires me so that I can go and hopefully inspire others. So it, it varies. Like you said, nobody has their one thing. What's your go-to? You probably don't get nerves anymore, but what do you do, if anything, or what did you do <laughs> in the past? I absolutely get nerves and I get nerves because I don't accept to speak at anything that I don't think is important. So if it's important to me, then I'm going to, I'm going to have those healthy nerves because I want to do it right. And I want to serve that audience. So my thing is really before I leave the house. So I have, you know, theme songs <laughs> that I will listen to that mm -hmm. will, you know, boost me up. So the music, our neighbors will have to endure the morning. They're probably sitting there going, oh, we need to a speaking gig today. The music's <laughs> blaring and it's all, Her you know, let's music. go. And so I will do that or I will play it in the car if I'm driving myself there. Just so, but once I'm there, then I just like to focus and be quiet. Sometimes I'll steal off before I speak rather than being in the audience right up until the minute before. And that's mm -hmm. also a bit about me. I like to feel that everything's in hand. So, you know, I will have organized, you know, the clothes will be sorted and picked up from the dry cleaners and ironed several days early. I don't want anything to be an issue last minute. You're, so you're a I arrive gotcha. early. I don't like to feel rushed. I feel like I've got there. I like to hear other people speak in the space where I'm going to speak mm -hmm. so I can go, okay, I'm really mindful. There's a, there's a bit of dead. The sound's not very good over there. I've noticed this person over there is using a hearing loop, so I'm going to make sure that I look at them and, and engage with them and make sure they can hear me, all those kind of things. I like to feel like when I step onto that stage, I've done everything I possibly can to succeed. So all I have to worry about then is making sure the audience is well served. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, and it it is good to see the room beforehand, depending on what I'm talking about. If there's a lot of data and stats and so forth, I may have note. And before I realized you need to go into the room, check out the sound, check out the setup or the tables you shaped. Is it, you know, campus style? How are they set up? I, I got to a couple of engagements and I needed a podium to put my notes on, you know, or my or my iPad or whatever I was using. And there's nothing there. They've just got a lapel mic. And that's a bad time to realize it as you're walking in the room being introduced. So, you know, and that also goes to having uh, good communication with the event planner if it's not a TEDx talk because we're talking about communicating public speaking and ensuring that they know what you need not just assuming that there's going to be a projector there or the type of microphone that you like or whatever that that pre-planning that you do really makes 
because that would give you nerves. If you didn't have nerves, if you get there and all of a sudden you go, oh, I can't see. You just got this little bitty light on and I'm, <laughs> you know, I can't see. All of that has happened to me. And it's, you know, it's a learning experience. But just doing a, a little pregame and, and scouting, if you will, uh, will definitely help you feel more comfortable and confident. Even if you have to go on a, on a day before, days before or whatever, mo- most folks will allow you to do that. You you talked about it a little bit, Juanita, but we know that good communication and public speaking can truly fast track your career or help your business growth. Why is that so? What are some ways that it makes a difference that you as the entrepreneur, as the owner, as the manager are a good public speaker? Well, they're two very different things, so I'll quickly talk about them. In your corporate career, okay. if you're still in corporate, um, it is a way for you to be seen, to be noticed. Mm-hmm. Um, people like in their organisation to have hypos, high potential employees, people who are stars. So it is a wonderful way for people to see that you can shine, that you have this tool in your toolbox. So it's not just that you're good on paper, but you can get up and champion and advocate for yourself, but also for the company. So mm-hmm. that makes people feel really good and really comfortable about putting you in rooms with potential other business people, potential partners, potential organizations, people you can sell to. And that is going to help fast track your career. Um, as is, if you are a great speaker as a leader and you are really good at inspiring your team, getting them motivated, making them feel a part of something bigger and hitting deadlines, all of that is going to help fast track your career. And in terms of business growth, there is absolutely, I would argue, and I'm biased, but nothing better to fast track business growth than being an incredibly powerful public speaker. First of all, it gives you exposure. When you're out Mm -hmm. there talking about your business, uh, that is amazing exposure. When somebody puts you on a stage and it's not your stage, so if it's a peak industry body or a a local specialist group in that area or a highly credible event brand and they put you on the stage, they are elevating you to the status of an expert in your field. And there is like money can't buy exposure to basically Mm -hmm. have another reputable organization say, you should listen to this person of XYZ company. They are the experts. And then if you go and you give a great presentation and you serve, not sell, because I very much um, passionately believe that public speaking should be about serving and not Agreed. selling. The selling mm-hmm. comes as an added bonus when they know, like, and trust you as the expert. Correct. You should serve yeah. on stage. That elevation as an expert that has been bestowed by somebody else, you can't buy that level of credibility and exposure. So it, it's absolutely wonderful. And it, the elevation as being a leader just then – you know, it helps you at all different levels of your sales funnel as well. So you'll get people, I always try anytime I speak to have an accompanying free guide uh, Mm -hmm. for what I just spoke about. It's a way that I add value to people who have come and given their time and often their money to hear me speak. It's like, here is something in addition to what you just got to take away. And they join my email list to get it. Uh, Mm -hmm. They get enormous value. If they never buy anything from me, I feel like, great, I did a little bit of good in the world and helped them along in their journey. But if they go in five months, 10 months, two weeks, two years, you know, I really want to do some work about public speaking. Who was that person I saw on that stage that was the expert? Yeah. And then they you planted you. a seed and they remember. Yeah. yeah you planted oh, a seed and, and people get frustrated sometimes because, you know, they don't get immediate results in in their minds but when you plant seeds sometimes it takes time and it it might not be the right time I even saw that when I was practicing dentistry you know you give out your cards you talk to people it might be two years later they come in for a checkup but they remembered me because typically I was out at some event talking about oral health and they remembered that and then when it was time to go to a dentist they remembered me so I I absolutely love the way you you put that and and it doesn't turn people off as much when you're 
serving and adding value to their lives is when you're just constantly pitching by me, by me, by me, by me. Absolutely does not. No, I, talk- I loathe that. I, I always feel like I need to go home and take a shower. A shower, it's- wash my hands, <laughs> like, change clothes. It- <laughs> that was really icky. I just, you know, it, and it's, it, you just look around, you just have to look around the audience and everyone gets, it's not Read the room. Yeah. Read the room. Um, if you, you know, if people have paid to see you already or they've given up their time, their very valuable time to come to an event where you are speaking, give them value. Earn yes. the status and the credibility as an expert that you have been bestowed by being invited to speak. Oh, and the other right. thing when you do at this event, just important tip, hang around for the whole event. Don't be oh, that speaker who arrives, speaks and runs. First of all, super rude, uh, but also that is an enormous missed opportunity. Some of the biggest contracts and clients I've ever gotten, um, not to mention being booked for your next speaking gig, happens in the morning tea queue or in the, in the lunch queue when people come up after you talk and say, that was great. I really appreciated this. Um, no one at that point, by the way, is coming up to you and saying, hi, I'm a potential client. That's, that's no. not how that conversation goes. But they might ask for um, more information about something you said. Mm-hmm. They might want to check a source or just tell you you did a really great job. Uh, but then, you know, they get your free guide or they get on your list or they follow you on socials and, mm-hmm. you know, two weeks later, six months later, two years later, you've got a speaking gig or a client. So don't be that person who speaks and runs. Right. It's awful. T- t- time permitting. Yeah, because I have to say in the South, sometimes our programs can be like extremely long. But as much as possible, especially if you know you can't stay late, then get there early and meet people and shake their hands. And of course, you're going to pass on, you know, information to contact you. Uh, And that, you know, it may be a flight, there may be other reasons, make sure people understand why you have to go that you'd love to be there. But it it means so much to the event organizers and the attendees that you're interested in what what they're doing beyond just, I came here to you know, impart this knowledge and I don't need, there's nothing I can gain, nothing you can give me. And, and that air comes off and it, it is off putting. It really is. It really is. You, you said something when we uh, spoke before that uh, was interesting to me. You talked about a way to introduce yourself with confidence. And I've been waiting. I've been waiting for this moment to ask you, because I'm not sure I feel like I have, but I'm not sure that I have been introducing myself with confidence. Would you uh, demonstrate how one introduces themselves with confidence? Because that's your first impression. So it's so important. So there's the important thing is, I, I tell people it's pretty much five steps, but this is not a set and forget. So you, the first thing you need to know is this is not a one-time thing. This should be customized to every single time you introduce yourself. So it should be formal if it's a formal setting. It should be informal if it's an informal setting. Mm-hmm. But mine would, for example, in this instance, say, hello, I'm Juanita Wheeler, a public speaking coach and speech writer. I help entrepreneurs, executives, thought leaders, and change makers to deliver and develop presentations worthy of their great ideas. With three master's degrees and over 20 years experience, I am expertly qualified to help you achieve what you're looking for. That was an off-the-cuff version, but... uh, It's very good. That was because today we're talking about public speaking. But to give you an idea of how that would vary, if I was talking to, I I recently spoke on a panel that was talking about the challenges of juggling parenting and careers. Mm -hmm. So in that instance, I didn't talk about my public speaking. It was, you know, hi, I'm Winita Wheeler. I'm the mother of three 20-something young sons, the owner of my business and a former teen mum. So what you need to do is make sure that what you share to somebody mm-hmm. is um, is what is relevant to that room right. uh, and make sure that you are, don't just give your job title. Everyone thinks when I introduce myself, I'm just going to give my job title. Now, mm-hmm. first of all, if you have something like the director of marketing, that means 20 different things at 20 different companies. It sure does. It doesn't really tell anybody what you do. 
So the best thing you can do is give them your name, choose a greeting, give them your name. You should always give people your full name in a business setting. If you think you are ever going to have any kind of business or client supplier relationship, use your full name. It says, I'm professional and I came to play. And then tell them what experiences you have that are going to be relevant to the topic they're discussing today. So whether it's about parenting, whether it's about entrepreneurship, whether it's about social change leadership, whatever it is, be able to pivot to let them know why you have relevant experience to this. I was helping um, an entrepreneurial woman with this topic a little while ago and she was saying, I can't introduce myself. I'm terrible. I'm getting asked to send my blurb to people to introduce me when I come on stage. She goes, I have no qualifications, no degrees, no nothing. And mm. we talked for a bit. And, and at the end it was like, okay, cool. Tell me who you serve and what you do and why you're uniquely placed to do it. And she was like, we worked out and in the end, her introduction was, hi, I'm insert name. Um, and she helps people to um, overcome financial debt problems and reestablish their credit score. She says, That's and then important. her unique experience was with over 20 years of experience working on the dark side of credit retrieval, I know all the tips and tricks that the industry doesn't want you to know, and I can help you improve your credit score. And I'm like, I'm sorry you had 20 years of experience doing this and you know all these secrets and you're trying to tell me you don't have any qualifications or experience that are worthy of your introduction. And so we fixed that. But um, Absolutely. People, Great example. Have, people have a perception that if it doesn't come on a piece of parchment, they don't have a qualification. I had another one with a woman who had um, raised three children who have autism. And I'm like, you go and speak at an autism conference or on an autism podcast or in a discussion panel, that should be tattooed to your forehead. I'm like, that is absolutely relevant and incredibly powerful experience. So you've got to stop thinking of credentials as being limited to parchment pieces of paper. So introduce yourself with the intent that stop using your business title unless it adds value. I mean, if you're an astronaut for NASA, yeah, sure, chuck that in. But other than that, <laughs> Um, tell them why, who you serve, what you help them to do, and why you are uniquely placed to do that. And if it's in a conversational chat, you know, over cocktails, then you're not going to just hit them with all five in one sentence. But they're the things you're going to weave in throughout the conversation. And that's how you do it. But own your awesome. Don't shy away. And don't fall into the very traditional, very male dominated, you know, stale male and pale boardroom introductions of, hi, this is my name and this is my impressive title at my company. No, at my you're impressive than that. company. All right. Yeah, exactly. Tell them who you serve, what solution you can get for them, and why you are uniquely placed to be able to help them. Best introduction Beautiful. you could possibly do. Beautiful. That's an amazing takeaway there, folks. Been lots of good tips, but that's a great one, especially for my, my young entrepreneurs out there that are trying to build up their business. That's really, really good. How you can serve, how you can help them and why you're uniquely qualified to do so. Before we go, tell me about your company. You're not just a TEDx coach. You have a company full and frank. And tell me about your company and how listeners can connect with you to learn more. So my company is called Full and Frank because I am very, very frank. I figure why waffle when you can just tell somebody what they need to know in a very short amount of time and then they can go and do it. Uh, the best place to connect with me is on my website. I have a, a resources page which provides a range of free tools, including some guides to help you with public speaking and to help you grow your business with public speaking. And you mm -hmm. can find that at fullandfrank.com forward slash tools. Sweet, sweet. And we'll definitely include that in the show notes. Uh, it, this has been a remarkable conversation. I wish we had more time because I, I've, I've certainly gained some insights from this discussion and I can only imagine uh, how much better your clients are after working with you. Thank you so much, Juanita Wheeler. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Indeed. And thank you, listeners, for your time and support of this woman-owned indie podcast. Remember to like, 
subscribe, and share for more like this. Until next time, be safe and be well. Thank you.